Good morning to everyone. We're thankful to see those of you that are here. Thankful for those of you that are uh, watching via the live stream or that will watch later on the uh, uh, YouTube post. Again, we're thankful to God for the grace and the mercy to have, have all of these avenues that, that we can use to worship Him together and to, to share His Word, to share our hope and our confidence in Him. And I hope to draw us closer to Him and closer to one another. It, it's, it's a great blessing to me to realize that even though there are those that are many miles and in some instances maybe half a world away, and yet we all come before the throne of the same God to give Him praise and honor and glory for His great grace and mercy. We invite you to turn with us this morning to 2 Corinthians 13th chapter and 14th verse. As Brother Joe observed, if you went any further, there wouldn't be anything left to Corinthians. The last, last chapter and the last verse of 2 Corinthians. church, to think about our brothers and sisters, not only in the congregation that we meet, but wherever God has called them to assemble before his throne, and to remember this prayer, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. Amen. We talk a lot about grace. We hear a lot said about grace. <clears throat> Most people that identify themselves as Christian have some idea about grace, that at least it's a concept that exists in the scriptures. We understand that without the grace of God, we would have no hope. Without the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, all would be lost. And we often, we often express this, this idea of, of his grace as being something that we've received that we didn't deserve, and that's very true. We talk about it being something we received that we didn't labor for, and that's very true. Sometimes I think what we fail to understand is it's something that we have received that we could not labor for. You see, there's a difference in me getting something that I didn't deserve and that I didn't do anything to get than there is me getting something that I didn't deserve that I couldn't have done anything to receive. 
The idea that I didn't do anything to get it kind of leaves open on the, on, the, on the back end of that thing the thought that, well, I didn't do anything to get it and he gave it to me, but I could have done something. I just didn't and he didn't wait for me to do it. He just gave it to me anyway. I want you to understand this morning, children of God, that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ is not simply something that you didn't earn. It's something you could not earn. We could never do enough. We could never perform enough. We don't have ever, there's not enough obedience in the whole wide world to make us deserving of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. If there was, it wouldn't be grace. That's what Paul said. He said, Paul said basically, if I can earn it, then it's not grace. If I can earn it, then it's by my works. How wondrous the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ ought to be to us. How wondrous to consider that it is his, we didn't do anything to deserve him willingly laying aside the glory of Almighty God, which according to the scripture he was. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And without Him was not anything made that was made. And He willingly, we could not compel Him. We could not bind Him. We, could, we didn't even know to desire Him, except for the mercy of God bestowed upon our, on our hearts. And he willingly laid aside all that glory and all of that majesty that we can't even begin to truly think about or comprehend and took upon a house of clay. And he didn't just appear as a mighty man of valor, although I think he proved in the scriptures that he could. I, I believe that that is in essence who Joshua saw whenever he was getting ready to lead God's children across to begin the process of taking the land of Canaan. And there appeared before him a man that day. And he, he, could, he Joshua wasn't sure about it. Joshua inquired of that man who was obviously a man of valor a man of strength, a man of power. And he said, are you for us or are you against us? And the answer Joshua has received is, I am now come. I am in this present moment appearing unto you as the captain of the host. Now he would later come in the form of a babe, wrapped in a manger, laid in swaddling clothes. But that's that's not the way that's not the way that he came that day. That day he appeared. You see, Jesus is not new. The Son of God is not, the Word of God is not new. The scripture tells us God sent his son. He didn't say God made his son and then sent him. God sent his son. God sent. His only begotten Son. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And everything that we have received through the power of that Word has been by His grace. We don't deserve it. It's foolish for us to think that we could. If we believe the Word of Jesus... Calls you your remembrance again. See, I know these things aren't new to you. I know I'm not telling you anything you haven't heard before. But by the grace and the mercy of God, I call to your remembrance that there was a time when Jesus looked at his disciples and told them, if you could obey every law and every word of God, to the letter. If you didn't leave any of it undone, you did words. He said, 
this is what you could say about that. I am a slow and unprofitable servant. Does that sound like anybody that's deserving? Now remember what he said here. If you kept the law of God, if you were obedient to a jot and a tittle, if, if you never left any of it undone, then you could say, I'm a slow and unprofitable servant. Because you haven't done anything other than what was required. Notice he didn't even say you claim to be a child. He did, he, you had, if we were obedient in all things, we have nothing to boast of and nothing that we can claim for ourselves because then all that we have done has, has been un, slow and unprofitable service. We haven't gained God anything. Nor have we gained ourselves anything. Slow and unprofitable. It is the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that causes even our obedience to amount to anything. And what that amounts to is it is the proof of our love for Him. If you love me, He said, keep my commandments. So when by his grace, you see, I keep his commandments, all that does is bear witness of the fact of my love for him. And the scripture is quite plain about why I love him, isn't it? We love him because he loved us first. That, you understand that? It didn't just say, well, he fell in love with me first and then I fell in love with him. What that scripture says to me is this, that it had he not first loved me, I would never have loved him. I would never have sought him out. I would have never run after him had he not first loved me according to his grace. I didn't deserve that love. I didn't do anything to get that love. I could not do anything to get that love. It came according to his purpose in grace. He didn't lay down his life for me because I was worthy of it. He didn't lay down his life for me because he saw down through time that somewhere along the line I'd be, that I deserved for him to. He knew before he ever left the portals of glory that there would never be anything in me that would be worthy of the grace that he would pour out in our lives and in our hearts. That there was not, a, that there was not anything in me that was deserving. <laughs> and not only was there not anything in me that was deserving, there wasn't anything that I could do that I could do to make myself deserving. He didn't come because of anybody's, what we any of us deserve. He came because of his grace bestowed upon us. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. <clears throat> you see, I don't think Paul thought for a minute that he was sending them the grace of Jesus Christ. And as I said, he, he, he certainly wasn't telling them that, that, that if they did what he told them in this letter, that they would be deserving of the grace of Jesus Christ. What he was calling to their attention was this. Paul was saying, it is my prayer to God that the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you so that you might understand the words that I have written to you. So that you might understand the gospel that is preached unto you. So that you might understand my purpose and my will in you. So that you might be able to give God glory whereas you would not be able to otherwise because that takes the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
we don't deserve it. We not only didn't do anything to earn it, but we couldn't do anything to earn it. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God Do you understand this morning, children, that God loved us while we were yet in our sins? That he didn't love me because I was pretty or because I was good or because I was kind or because anything. He loved me because it pleased him to do so. See, I, I learned a long time ago that that was the only reason that God does anything that he does is because it is pleasing unto him to do so. We have the grace of Jesus Christ because it was pleasing to God. We have his everlasting love because it pleases him. We have his love to such a degree that not only does he love us and care for us and protect us, but he loves us enough to correct us and to chasten us, to, to rebuke us when we need it, to encourage us when we need it. And he, his love is so great for us that he never takes his eyes off of you. I love the little girls God gave me. I loved hearing their little voices call me daddy. And I never wanted to see any harm. I, I didn't want to have a scrape or a scratch. But in spite of how much I loved them, there were times that my attention slipped. There were times that something else caught my eye. There were times that that may, maybe just for a split second. How many of us over the years have talked about how fast things can happen, how quickly they can do things? I remember coming home from school one afternoon and it was obvious my mama had just absolutely been in tears. It turns out that my baby sister, who at that time was three or four years old, while mama was in the living room ironing, she had gone in the kitchen, slid a stool up to the counter, climbed up on the stool, up on the counter, across through the sink and up on the counter on the other side, reached up over the refrigerator and got Mama's multivitamins with iron. She got to cut, because she realized when she was standing there, Mama could see her, she turned around, she went back to the sink, got over on the counter on the other side and sat down and proceeded to take all of Mama's multivitamins with iron. Then she climbed down, climbed back down to school, Walked in the living room, showed Mama the box, said, look, Mama, I took all your violence. <clears throat> my Mama loved us. Never been a minute in my life that I ever doubted my Mama's love or my Mama's concern for us. But even being right there in the same house almost in the same room, practically in sight of what was going on, that happened. Now, thankfully, weren't any, any great big issues with it. She called the doctor and said, well, you know, her tummy may be tore up for a few days but, and just kind of watch her. And he said, well, you know, make sure she drinks plenty. But he said, you know, she should be okay. The only, the only real effect we saw of it was for Two or three days after that, every time she got to play and got hot and got sweating, the smell of iron just about knocked out. 
But you see, that didn't happen because my mama didn't love her. It happened because we can't have our eye everywhere at once. But you see, this is why the love of God is better than, than our love and, and supersedes anything that we can possibly do because God, the, the Word of God tells me that there's not a hair that falls from your head that God does not know, that God does not see, that there is not a sparrow that falls from the sky without God's awareness. This is the love of God. This is the thing that we pray that you understand is that the love of God is such that whatever the sorrow, whatever the heartache, whatever the trouble, whatever the joy, whatever the good thing, there is nothing that happens in your life. There is not a heartbeat. There is not a breath that you take that the love of God has not given you and does not watch over and does not keep. And that when we don't need breath any longer, isn't that amazing to think about? That the day is going to come for me. You know, we, we, we dread this sometimes, but when we look at it as, as such a terrible thing. Think about it in a minute. The day is going to come when by the love of God, my life is going to be so rich and so pure that I'm not going to need these old lungs to draw breath anymore. I'm not going to need this heart to pump blood through my veins anymore as it does here. That I will have a body perfected according to the will and the power, the purpose, and the love of Almighty God. How wonderful to know the love of God. The deep charity of God's love. You know, we use that word charity a lot, I think, without ever really understanding what it might what it actually means. We talk about when we when we give something out of our abundance, or maybe even out of our out of our, our, our poverty as the scripture talks about. We, we call that charity. If somebody's home in the community burns down, we get together and, and, and we, we get them a gift card to Walmart and we, we take them, you know, we take clothes and we, we take sheets and we take towels and, and people call that charity. Paul said, I can give all of my goods to the poor and still not have charity. He went so far as to say, I can sacrifice my body. I can give my body to be burned and not have charity. You see, I can give everything I have and there not be an ounce of charity in it. I can do it in such a way that I want to get the glory for it. That I want to be. See, the love of God is charitable toward us. And that God, now granted, he is worthy of glory for his love. And we should glorify him for his love. But God did not give us, give us his love in order that we might glorify him. God's giving of his love was pure and, and, and his only purpose in it was because. He loved us and loves us and will always love <clears throat> us. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost. We're not talking about taking bread and wine here. We're talking about a daily fellowship with God, the Holy Ghost. We're talking about a daily eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood 
in meditating upon his word and in recognizing his goodness in our lives and in understanding that we have communion, communication, that we that we are able that by the through the grace of Jesus Christ, by the love of God bestowed upon us, that we are able to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit of God. That he is a daily presence in our lives. That we can run to him when we're hurt. That we can rejoice in him when we're glad. That we can share every trial, every trouble, every tribulation. Not because it helps him. But because it helps us. We all, it, it is wonderful. With the, that when you've got a friend that, that's close enough that, that you can just pretty well share anything with them. If you need to go on a little rant while well, you can and you know they're still going to be your friend when you're done. If you do something foolish that they're still going to be your friend when all of that falls out and is over and done with. It's a wonderful thing to know that that you know, if your heart's broke, <clears throat> that you've got a friend that you can pick up the phone and call or that you can go down the street and see. And that, that you've got a friend. You have, we, we all, I trust, have been blessed to have at least one friend in our lives that was so close enough to us that, that sometimes, even if we hadn't seen them for a while, if something bad was going on in our life, all of a sudden you got a call or a call or or an email in this day and time, or a text. Just had you on the mind. You see, we've got one friend that we fe that we can fellowship with, that we have communion with every minute of every day of our lives. Every, whenever we reach out through the grace of God, through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to the love of God, when we reach out, there is the Holy Spirit of God that we can communicate with. That will, you see, that's again, that's the wonderful thing about communication, isn't it? True communication is not one way. If all I'm ever doing is telling you how I feel, or what I've done. And I don't ever give you, and I don't hear from you how you feel about what I've said or what I've done or how you're feeling, how you're that. If that's unless we've got that back and forth, unless we've got that give and take there, it's not really communication. We have fellowship. It's another meaning of that word communion. Fellowship of the Holy Ghost. We all got a little taste of what it was like a few weeks back to feel like we'd just been absolutely robbed of our fellowship. Wasn't anything wrong with our love for one another or concern for one another or our prayers for one another. <coughs> we went a few Sundays that out of an abundance of caution and concern for one another that we didn't come here. I came, sat up here on the front pew of the choir and fought the video recording camera there on the rail and preached the gospel to people that I couldn't see. Now, I was thankful to be able to do that. But let me tell you, there was a... There was an emptiness of fellowship. Thankfully, not, not, with, not with the Holy Ghost, not with God. But my goodness, I missed your faces. I missed hearing your voices. And we all learned firsthand a little of what it would be like to be absolutely denied our fellowship that we are so blessed by God to enjoy.
Now, if our fellowship with one another is so sweet and precious, what should our fellowship with the Holy Ghost be? Do we stop in our busy lives and in all the day-to-day -day turmoil and in all the hoopla that's going on around us and think every day that we need to acknowledge and to rejoice in the fact that we have fellowship with the Holy Spirit of God and that there's no pandemic in the world <coughs> that can change. There's not enough sin in the world to destroy that. There's not enough war in the world to blow that up. That there is nothing that can come between you and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship, the communion of the Holy Ghost. Praise God Praise God for that. So know that this is my prayer. That the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, which not only did we not do anything to deserve, but couldn't do anything to deserve, and the love of God freely given because it was according to his good pleasure to do so. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that makes all of that, the rest of that live in our hearts. Be with you all. Amen.